Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, verses 27 to 32. Sorry, to 38. So Jesus went on with his disciples to the village, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and, Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of them, the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of God with the holy angels. May these words be to us our light and our life. As a Boy Scout growing up, I used to love getting Boy's Life magazine. My favorite part every month was reading the feature called Scouts in Action. Some of you Boy Scouts are nodding your heads. True stories of Scouts who saved people's lives. Like 13-year-old Jacob Sturrock from Brantford, Connecticut, who was fishing with a friend on a paddle boat when a nearby canoe capsized, sending a man, a girl, and two dogs into the water. They couldn't swim, and so they called for help. Jacob and his friend maneuvered their paddle boat closer and Jacob told the man and the girl to stay with their boat and jumped in the water to try and help the dogs first. But the man and the girl panicked and swam for the paddle boat too. And as they all tried to get on board, the whole paddle boat tipped over, sending everyone back into the water and waterlogging the, the paddle boat. A calm Jacob convinced everyone to just grab hold of the paddle boat while he grabbed the rope on the front and saved everyone by pulling them to shore. I always read these features faithfully and wondered, wondered if someday I would be willing to save someone. Our theme this Lent, found at the top of your bulletin, is words to live by with a question mark. Scanning through the readings for this season, Corinne, Janine, Brad, and I noticed words in each passage that we hear a lot but do not necessarily like. The question is, can these words that are so loaded with baggage still be for us our light and our life, as we say? How do we connect to the spirit that is behind the words that cannot be named, that spirit that cannot be named and yet is ever present? 
So the word for today is save, as in savior, or salvation, and being saved. Turns out that this may be a fitting word for this week for many reasons, not the least of which is as we remember the life of evangelical preacher Reverend Billy Graham. Reverend Graham devoted his life to saving souls. I remember watching him on television with my parents one time. I can still picture this dynamic man standing at some podium in the middle of a stadium surrounded by tens of thousands of people. I thought, there's no way I'm going to get up in front of a big group of people and preach like that. <laughs> I remember my parents were moved, but pretty skeptical of Graham's words. And I didn't really understand why at the time. Listening this week to a few clips from some of Graham's sermons, I was reminded of his very straightforward, simple, central message. Confess your sins and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Then you will be saved. And by that, he meant you will get into heaven. So, how would you answer if I asked you, are you saved? Marcus Borg, in his book, How to Speak Christian, reminds us that salvation, quote, names the yearning desire, hope, and purpose of the Christian life, end quote. Now, for many of us, the word salvation and its related words saved have negative associations. They conjure up images of a fear-based form of Christianity where you either end up in heaven or hell, depending on whether you do the right things, believe the right things, and declare Jesus as your Lord and Savior. In this view, salvation was promised only to those who accept Jesus, not to the Jews or Muslims or anyone else. In this view, Jesus paid for our sins by his death, and in fact, his death was God's plan to save humanity from sin. I think it's safe to say that this view of salvation turns many of us off, along with the kind of smugness that sometimes comes from those who believe they are saved while others aren't. Even though I think we can all acknowledge that this troubled world could use some saving, this understanding of salvation seems inadequate. But rather than give up the idea of salvation altogether, let's consider some of the other ways salvation is presented in the Bible. Marcus Borg points out, first, that there really is no notion of an afterlife in the Hebrew Bible until you get to the book of Daniel, one of the last books written in the Hebrew Bible. So most of the hundreds of passages referring to salvation in the Hebrew scriptures are about something else. For example, salvation as liberation, finding freedom. Think of Moses leading the Exodus and the Hebrew people out of Egypt. Salvation also is return from exile, returning home. The book of Isaiah was largely written while the Hebrew people were exiled in Babylonia, dreaming, longing for a way to go home. Salvation is also presented as rescue from peril, finding refuge and safety. As we heard earlier, this is perhaps one of the primary ways salvation is portrayed in the Psalms. 
In the New Testament, while salvation is sometimes talked about as eternal life, there are also other meanings as well there. Salvation as transformation, as the movement from blindness to sight, from death to life, from sickness to health, from fear to trust. And salvation is also portrayed as larger political and social change, the movement from injustice to justice and violence to peace. Borg's point is that the biblical notions of salvation span both the personal, spiritual, and social political. To suggest salvation is only about getting into heaven is a distortion. So too is suggesting salvation is only about social justice. Salvation, Borg says, quote, is the twofold transformation of ourselves and the world. We yearn for the transformation of our lives, for a fuller connection to what is, for liberation from all that keeps us in bondage, for sight, for wholeness, for healing. And most of us also yearn for a world that is a better place, for ourselves, for our contemporaries, our communities, for our children and our grandchildren, for the people in the world of the future." End quote. So just what kind of salvation is Jesus talking about in today's reading when he says, those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. Jesus is playing with the word saved. We assume it is good to save something, especially saving a life, but Jesus says those who want to save their life will lose it. Ironically, salvation in this passage is even about letting go of wanting to be saved. It's not that we shouldn't care about salvation. Jesus himself grieves the suffering in the world as much as anyone, but he realizes that not all that we do in the name of salvation actually saves. Sometimes we get in our own way. Jesus says salvation is actually about losing your life. What might this mean? Well, we might assume it means being willing to physically die for our faith. A very real possibility for some of the persecuted early followers of Jesus to whom Mark was writing. But a broader reading of the gospel suggests there might be more than one way to lose your life. You can give away all your possessions, like the repentant tax collector Zacchaeus. You could break rank, like the Roman centurion who asked Jesus to heal his servant. You can risk ridicule, like the woman at the well, to give a stranger a drink of water. These are all ways we might sacrifice, give up something of ourselves, our position, our pride, our privilege, our reputation for something greater. Perhaps the invitation to lose your life simply means get over yourself. It's not all about you. Get out of the way of God's grace. Now that may sound easy to say, but difficult to live, especially when it does come to death. I have no doubt that much of the energy and concern around the question, are you saved, stems from our very real fear of death and what might or might not happen after. Heaven would be another good word for us to explore in this season, another time. 
But I don't think I'm going out on a limb to say that everyone here this morning should not worry about whether or not you qualify for the afterlife. So if we put aside that notion of salvation, how do we begin to talk about the other meanings of salvation? How would you answer the question, are you saved? Here's what one Anglican priest answered when asked that question by an evangelical colleague. He said, it depends. Do you mean, am I saved in the past, present, or future? If you mean, am I saved in the sense, has God already done all that is necessary to save me? Sure, then yes, certainly. If you mean, am I saved in the sense, do I presently live in a life-giving, saving relationship with God, then my answer is yes. If you mean, am I saved in the sense, have I already become all that I might become? Then certainly not. How do we stay open to the saving grace of God? Salvation really does come down to what is the purpose of the Christian life. Answer this and you have your definition of what it means to be saved. Now unfortunately, mainline Christians have let fear-based Christianity define what most people think it means, even people outside the church, what it means to be saved. I am probably still more comfortable trying to save a stranger who is drowning than sharing the good news of God's grace with someone I don't know. And friends, that is one reason that we have struggled as a church. We have stopped talking outside of these walls about why our faith matters and how it can make a real and lasting difference, not only to us, but to the world. By doing so, we have legitimized this narrow view of salvation and allowed ourselves to be judged by it. Evangelicals like Reverend Billy Graham might say our timidity comes from not accepting the fact that we need saving, that our well-being is dependent upon God's grace. But I don't buy it. I think we know that there is trouble in River City. I also think we do see how faith makes a difference in each other's lives and even in our own. But we have let others create a sense of spiritual inadequacy in us by giving them authority over these words. And that, that must end. We must name and claim the power not only of these words and stories, but of the God of love, not the God of fear that is behind them. We must get over ourselves so that each of our lives can resonate more deeply, more broadly, more boldly with God's love and grace. Amen.